Attention crew, this is your Captain Caliban speaking. This is a supplemental episode of Enterprising Individuals, where we bring you news and tidbits from the world of Trek, also interviews with special guests, and a few little surprises along the way. I'm still coming down off the high of talking to Keith DeCandido last week as a Star Trek fan and a person who likewise writes on the internet. It was a real treat for me, and it's a fun and insightful discussion, so I hope it was a treat for you as well. But the mission continues this week, and the mission is bringing you a roundup of Star Trek news from the last two weeks. And there's been some news, believe me. A discovery, Star Trek films, new Star Trek films, Clint Howard and Stephen Hawking? And speaking of highs, I've given myself a heart flutter trying to keep up with all the updates, but it's nothing a little quarter zine can't fix. Tricky stuff. Ah, sit on it, bucko. (laughs) Ah! Murderers! Assassins! You won't get me! Murderers! Killers! Let's get underway. I think I mentioned Star Trek Discovery before I ran off in a drug-fueled craze, and rightly so, as there is some great updates on the status of Season 2 of the new show. Filming has begun, and fans were treated to a short but tantalizing video that gives us a look at the production. That video, which features narration by Michael Burnham and Captain Christopher Pike via actor Jeffrey Hunter in excerpts from the unaired Star Trek pilot The Cage and the voice of Mr. Spock himself, Leonard Nimoy, is available on the Star Trek channel on YouTube and it looks great. They are 3D printing props. They're building sets and shooting. They're making uniforms. Red, gold, and blue uniforms. Plus, we get to see blueprints, uh, some of which are labeled Section 31. Hmm. And there's a set with Laurel's Chamber and Laurel's Garden, which is nice. Uh, Maybe she's got a green, uh, gray thumb. Uh, We also see what looks like a new alien or two, including a lizard-like alien being made up. Uh, Speculation on what race that lizard alien is runs from uh, maybe a Saurian, seen in Star Trek The Motion Picture, to possibly the predator species from the Kelpian homeworld. Hmm? Remember, Saru and his ilk are prey. Well, who's the predator? And maybe it's the Gorn. Actually, that's just me speculating. I think it might be the Gorn. This show really loves to reference the original series, and that one seems like a good reference. And speaking of references to the original series, we see the back of a yellow-shirted actor that looks a lot like Anson Mount as Christopher Pike. And we see Burnham walking into a room labeled 3F125. The trivia-minded among you may recognize that sequence as the designation of the crew quarters of one Commander Spock, as seen in the episode Amok Time. (laughs) Wait, wait, you're telling me that Spock had the same quarters from the time he served under Captain Pike pre-cage until at least season two of the original series and his promotion to commander well whatever they released a pack of men in the old days and who wants to rehang all those red curtains and, and move all this stuff he's got more crap on the walls of his quarters than a tgi fridays the last time we talked news i mentioned that tig Notaro had a role on the new season as chief engineer denise reno of the uss hiawatha well the website trek today got its hands on a casting announcement that had a little more information about reno and a few new characters The casting announcement states that Engineer Reno will use a wheelchair, but is otherwise, quote, extremely physically fit, end quote. It goes on to describe Reno as, quote, high energy and bordering on boisterous. She is happiest when she's fighting a stubborn bolt, a real gearhead, end quote. (laughs) I mean, I I love Tig Notaro. She's one of my favorite comedians, but she's none of those things. (laughs) But uh, maybe they're going in a different direction uh, for this role. People in wheelchairs... Or just like everybody else. There's another character on the announcement, uh, a female engineer named May, who is described as, quote, a friendly officer in her 20s who shows real concern for others when faced with danger, end quote. Requirements of the role are the ability to speak in a distinctive non-American accent and comedic experience is considered a plus. It's not clear if this character will be a Discovery officer or an Enterprise officer or a Hiawatha officer, but it looks like we'll get a look at other ships on the show, other Starfleet ships, and that's cool. And the big news is, is that the announcement also mentions a one to two episode role for a young boy, a Vulcan named Samuel. Now we already know, 
that Jonathan Frakes is directing the second episode of the new season, and that episode will feature flashback sequences involving Burnham and the young Spock. So is Samuel, in this case, a stand-in for Spock? Yes. Yes, of course. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Yes. Um, I'm still looking at this with a hypospray of caution and not... Cordrazine. But we've already met a lot of fun and interesting characters on Discovery, and it looks like we can look forward to meeting a few more. Or re-meeting them, in the case of Samuel. Got it, Samuel. And let me say, y'all thought I was crazy earlier this year when I speculated that we could see Season 2 of Discovery this fall. But take note, Season 1 of Discovery began shooting in January of last year. And it bowed or opened in late September. This year, there's no management musical chairs. There's no release of Star Trek Beyond to slow down production. They know what they're doing. It's ramped up. We could absolutely see Discovery Season 2 happen this fall or, or late in 2018. And when we do, rest assured, I will brag about being right. But also, rest assured, we will have all new episodes of our Discovery recap show, Discoverage, that will air live every Sunday night after the latest episode of Season 2 of Discovery. Well, the news doesn't stop there. It was announced by Paramount CEO Jim Giannopoulos during Paramount's presentation at CinemaCon last week that two, count them, two Trek features are currently in development. He didn't go into great detail, but it's probably safe to assume that one is the uh, Quentin Tarantino produced, possibly written, maybe directed, and hypothetically not in the Kelvin Universe film that may or may not be a time travel story theoretically based on Yesterday's Enterprise. Wow, we do not know a lot about that film. And the other is the official Star Trek IV, being written currently by J.D. Payne and Patrick McKay, which will feature the return of Chris Hemsworth as George Kirk and will absolutely feature time travel. This is big news, but it was followed up by even bigger news. According to Variety, British director S.J. Clarkson has been tapped to direct the new film, the, the Hemsworth one, not the Tarantino one. Now, if it's not apparent from her business name, secrets out, it should be from her pronoun, Clarkson will be the first woman to direct a Trek feature. This is her first feature, uh, at least as far as I can tell from her IMDb page, but she has an expansive resume in TV. She's directed on series like Dexter, uh, Orange is the New Black, Jessica Jones, and the recent Netflix series Collateral. So this is exciting news. Wow, so much is happening in the Trek sphere, and it's left me breathless. Or maybe that's the Cordrazine collapsing my lungs. But it's clear that Paramount recognizes it's time for Trek to suit up and get back on duty. And I'm looking forward to what's in store. Hey, did somebody mention Star Trek films? Oh, yeah, I did. Wow, that Cordrazine, it's really kicking in. Former Star Trek star Benedict Cumberbatch was on the Graham Norton show the other day to promote his new film, Avengers Infinity War. Oh, um, the uh, the Graham Norton show for our American listeners. Um, it's uh, like The Tonight Show, except all the guests come out at once and they sit on couches and it's actually funny. Cumberbatch told a story about the time that he had dinner with the late physicist and author Stephen Hawking, who of course himself appeared as himself in the sixth season Next Generation episode, Descent Part 1. I don't know how those two got hooked up or became friends, but perhaps they struck up a friendship after Cumberbatch played Hawking in the 2004 BBC TV movie Hawking. Well, uh, Cumberbatch at the time was filming Star Trek Into Darkness, and he had a big secret that the character John Harrison was actually... Did I get that right? No, not you. I was close. I say it was Benedict's secret because every other human being on Earth had figured out before the film was released that the identity of Harrison was a front and that Cumberbatch was playing a Kelvin Universe version of the classic character because J.J. just loves his little mystery boxes. Yes, he does. And he's going to stick with it, even if we all know what's going on. And it's a dumb idea. Interestingly, the name John Harrison was initially floated for the original version of Khan in the 60s, as I spoke about with John and Maria Jose Tenuto, along with many other interesting facts in our episode about Space Seed, which is available in our show feed. So at least they were trying to stick kind of to the script, but, you know, magic blood and... And yeah. Anyway, back to the fateful dinner. Cumberbatch and Hawking were, in Cumberbatch's words, on their third margarita, and he felt that he just had to share this big secret with somebody that he respected, and someone who would appreciate it, which is really touching. And as for Hawking, I'm sure he responded in the same way that we all did when we heard that J.J. Abrams was bringing back Khan. That sucks. Speaking of twists, wow, Corgazine is great for segues. 
We've got a twist on our usual social media highlight this week as I wanted to highlight an event that seeks to pit Star Trek against that other franchise with a star in the name. Oregon State University professors Randall Milstein and Joseph Orozco are holding a debate Thursday night, that's May 3rd, on the OSU campus in Memorial Union called Trek Wars, Visions of slash for Humanity, that will, quote, explore the Star Wars and Star Trek universes and the intellectual, spiritual, and political visions created in those franchises. The event is co-sponsored by Allied Students for Another Politics and the School of History, Philosophy, and Religion, and pizza will be provided. This sounds like a lot of fun, and the audience, uh, it might be limited. I mean, if you're not an OSU student or you don't live in Portland, your chances of catching this are slim. But it's the kind of inspiring and intellectual debate that I like to see in fandom. So if you can, check it out. Cosplay is encouraged. It's too soon to call a winner here. But I love how the sides break down. Uh, Dr. Milstein is a doctor of geology, and Dr. Orozco is a doctor of philosophy. Guess who likes Star Wars and who likes Star Trek? (laughs) I don't want to say that science isn't important to Trek. That's crazy. But it's the philosophical aspect that sets Trek apart and, in my opinion, puts it above Star Wars. So my latinum is on Dr. Orozco for this one. Give him hell. I mean, in an intellectual, spiritual, and political sense, of course. Remember, listeners, you can tweet to us or message the show and maybe have your comment read on the air. Just go to facebook.com forward slash EIST pod or find us at at EIST pod on Twitter or through our social media links on enterprisingindividuals.com. You can also reach the show at EIST pod at gmail.com with feedback and suggestions or to just say hello or to debate us in an intellectual, spiritual and political sense. We're waiting to receive your transmission. And since I've broken the magnetic seal, I guess we can keep talking about Star Wars. Um, I mentioned Clint Howard in the opening, who has a very specific Star Trek pedigree. He appeared, of course, as Baylock in the Corbomite Maneuver, the first production episode of Star Trek The Original Series. We've got a great show with David George III talking about that episode available in the show feed. And he appeared as um, Orion Guy in the brothel. On Kronos, I don't know if he had a character name, uh, in the most recent episode of Discovery, Will You Take My Hand? So his career literally spans Star Trek, which is pretty amazing. I mention him because he's also appearing uh, in a little student film his brother Ronnie is directing called Solo, A Star Wars Story, which comes out May 25th. This Friday, incidentally, is May the 4th, or Star Wars Day as well. I think every day is Star Trek Day, but that's just me. Why do I keep talking about Star Wars? Well, for our next two episodes, I'm talking with two guests that have impressive pedigrees in the Star Wars universe. The first is Pete the Retailer of Star Wars Minute, the podcast where they watch the Star Wars films a minute at a time. And the second is John Jackson Miller, who has written a bantha poodoo load of Star Wars novels and comics, which you should check out. But what I want you to do as the host of Enterprising Individuals is to focus on his Star Trek books, okay? They're incredible, really. In fact, his Prey trilogy of books, which features Klingons and and Worf and the USS Titan and a mountain of intrigue, and we actually talk about them in his upcoming episode this season that trilogy is currently available as an amazon kindle monthly deal you can get each book in the trilogy for one ninety nine each i'll include links in the show notes that'll take you to amazon and these great books and i don't know maybe while you're there i guess you can pre-order the paperback version of the canto Byte anthology which features a novella by john set in the casino city from the last jedi it comes out on may the 29th may the 4th be with you yeah 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 and maybe you're saying hey I already bought all of John Jackson Miller's books and comics the last time he was on the show to talk about Rightful Air, show available in the feed. And frankly, keep your lightsaber. I'd rather listen to a concert in 10 forward and then be in a play directed by Bev Crusher. Okay, I think I'm getting to see why some people like Star Wars better. Well, anyway, you lover of public performance and the arts, you can still support the show by going to our Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash EIST pod. It's there that you can sign up to be a crew member for the show for a small monthly donation, and you can get access to our exclusive subscriber content, like our live shows, including our upcoming live show with Melinda Snodgrass at Convergence 2018 in July, and my DS9 rewatch recaps, plus show merchandise and more. Just head to patreon.com forward slash EIST pod, and for as little as $1 a month, you can become a member of the crew. And as always, anything you contribute to the show will be appreciated and will help keep us flying. Thanks. 
And that's it for this supplemental episode of Enterprising Individuals. If you're an Apple Podcast listener and you haven't yet, why not look us up on Apple Podcasts and make sure that you are subscribed to the show. Also, write a little review if the spirit moves you and give us a rating at the very least. We'd appreciate it. It really helps. If you're not an Apple Podcasts user, you can still subscribe to the show on Google Play or Stitcher or wherever you get our show from. And if you leave positive comments and ratings and reviews on those platforms as well, we would be eternally grateful. Next week on Enterprising Individuals. He's been there from the very beginning. He was the breakout star of the original series and the cornerstone used to launch Trek films into the 21st century. The sallow face that launched 1,000 eyebrows. But what is the toll of being half human and half Vulcan? What does it mean to pursue logic and deny your emotions? And how is that conviction tested when disaster and danger mean that the only logical course is hopelessness? Pete, the retailer of Star Wars Minute, joins me on next week's show to talk about an episode of the original series that puts Spock's leadership abilities and his stoic philosophy to the test. It's the Galileo 7, next time on Enterprising Individuals. And until then, I'm your Captain Caliban, signing off and saying, live long and prosper. <laughs>